Jana Tova. Thank you, everyone, for joining us to sing, pray, reflect, and to celebrate on this Rosh Hashanah 5781. Although we are separated by space, I am going to address you as if we are together, because I believe we are together in spirit. Tonight, we are connected to each other through our purpose, through our peoplehood, and through our humanity. So even though I'm looking into a camera and not into your faces, I hope you will feel the sincerity of my message. Yes, this year is different. While on previous High Holy Days, I might have spoken about a trip to Israel or what I learned about a Jewish community someplace else far away in the world. This sermon is not about traveling or how I spent my summer vacation. It's what I learned about myself and others in recent months. It's about how the disorientation, displacement, and dysfunction during this pandemic can lead to transformation. My goal for tonight is to recognize, acknowledge, and address the supremely disorienting, painful, and anxiety-provoking situation we find ourselves in due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and to share with you Jewish insights that have been a source of hope and strength. Hopefully, there will be a few jokes that you will think are funny, but don't worry, since I can't see you or hear you, I'll pause or cue you ahead of time so you know when to laugh. I know we don't all share the same sense of humor. It's the beginning of a new year on the Jewish calendar, and we are in the sixth month of the pandemic. Rosh Hashanah usually brings in a new school year, new activities for the kids, a new football season, a new and wonderful season of B'nai Mitzvah and a packed calendar of Temple Beth Am activities. We have a direction, we have a path, we have goals, and we have things to shop for. Cue to laugh. But instead, our days are repeating, sometimes with haunting familiarity. These past six months are unlike any we have ever experienced. What we knew as our daily life no longer exists, and we have no known plan for the future. We have missed so much and have trouble even articulating the grief we've been feeling. Can we say we're grieving for missed graduations when others have lost loved ones who have died alone in a hospital without any family by their side? Can we grieve for postponed weddings when others have lost jobs and wait on long lines at food distribution sites? Can we grieve for the children who must learn remotely and miss out on socialization and play when we see the elderly among us so isolated that they begin to lose interest in life itself? Yes, we can. There is no hierarchy to our grief. It is not exclusive. It can extend beyond our losses to those of our friends, neighbors, and those we don't even know personally. Many of us are blessed. We have jobs, we have homes, we have food. We are doing okay. But that doesn't exempt us from anxiety and worry. And so we should grieve for what we have lost. Your college freshman living at home instead of on campus, your seventh grader, who waited her turn in anticipation to attend the weekly bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah celebrations with all of her friends, your high school athlete, musician, or a thespian, who knew that this was the year they were going to shine, they are sad and disappointed. Hear their pain. It, too, is real. This space that we are in now, between the known of the past and the unknown of the future, it has a name, it's called liminal space. And this term liminal space was first used by anthropologists 
to describe an adolescent boy who was about to undergo a tribal ritual in the wilderness signifying entering adulthood, leaving one stage, but not yet in the next place. Sound familiar? We have a ritual too for our young people in which they are moving from childhood to a time in which they are able to take on some more adult responsibilities. When they become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, they become a mitzvah man or woman, a new stage responsible to fulfill some of those adult obligations. And eventually, they will get to a place of adulting. Although, for some it may take longer than others. This has been our expectation and theirs. We have raised our young adults to move in and out of liminal space. We expect when a young person completes their education or training successfully, that they will find employment and eventually some level of self-sufficiency. Yes, of course, there are exceptions, but this was pretty much the rule, was it not? And now they're back in that liminal space, furloughs or underemployment or no employment. It's shaken confidence, fear, loss of independence. There is a bright side, well, that may be for millennials because they have really led the way for non-traditional workplaces and spaces, as well as creating new types of jobs. But if you are the kind of person who likes to see things as either black or white, you're not in Kansas anymore. We are in the gray area. It has soft edges, it's mushy all around, it's blurry, it is unclear. It's not where many of us feel comfortable. How many times a day do you consult a device for an answer, a definitive answer? Hey Siri, Alexa, Google, when, tell me, how do I, what time, where? We want to gather more and more information and data, believing it gives us some sense of control. The most help I ever get from Alexa is a timer telling me when to take the cookies out of the oven or when it shuffles and plays Grateful Dead songs. Laugh. We don't always need to accumulate more data. To function here and now, we need to respond to the data, adapt, not once, not twice during these months, but I think we need to adapt every day. More than early adapters to a new technology, we must simply be adapters, responsive adapters, ready to change, transform, and grow. We have lived with uncertainty since Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Until that time, human beings were immortal, sustained by the food in the garden. They even gave birth without pain. But following our short-term residence in the garden, our biblical leaders and personalities, from Noah to the patriarchs and matriarchs to the priests and prophets, face every challenge, heartbreak, betrayal, and loss, and emerge in a new reality. Noah and his family, isolated in the ark, are in that liminal space during the flood. The world they knew was gone, a new world was yet to be. Even after the rain stopped, Noah was too afraid to leave the ark. God had a call out to Noah, come out of the ark. And then God places that rainbow in the sky to reassure him it was safe to begin again. Moses. Moses is born in hiding, and then he too is placed in an ark for safety. He spends most of his life in the wilderness, leading a stiff-necked people to the land of Israel and teaching them Torah along the way. Which would have been a journey of only a few months lasts 40 years due to the Israelites' rebellious idolatry. What should have been a people filled with gratitude to God for freedom from slavery 
instead are a group of complainers who long for their life in Egypt, long for the past they knew. Moses, he feels despair and disappointment. His leadership is questioned by those closest to him and the unruly Rob he dedicates his life to save. He has such self-doubt in his ability to lead them, he asks God to take his life. He grieves the loss of his brother and his sister. And then God tells him that he too will die there in that wilderness, in that liminal space, and will never enter the Holy Land. He now then has to accept his greatest disappointment, and he must be satisfied by a vision of the land he will never set foot in. Moses spent most of his life in the spaces in between. I stood between you and Adonai, Moses tells the Israelites, because you were afraid. He lived between families, cultures, borders, and even between God and human beings. These were the spaces, the wilderness, where Moses changed from a man who was slow of speech, who experienced fits of anger, desire for revenge, despair, fatigue, and loneliness, to become the greatest prophet ever known and the humblest of all men. If even Moses had to muster courage and inspiration in his wilderness, why should we be any different in ours? Back in March, so, so long ago, when I set up my personal workspace in my home office, I taped to the wall two inspirational readings. On one side of my desk, Psalm 121, the beginning of the words, Esa and I, for since singing this psalm as a child during the High Holy Days, it has been my go-to psalm for comfort, for it assures me of God's presence during times of trouble. It begins with, Esa Enai El Haharim, May I and Yavo Ezri, Ezri May Imadonai El Sesha Mayim Pa'aretz. I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, creator of heaven and earth. And on the other side, another inspirational reading. Six daily questions to ask yourself while social distancing. Number one, what am I grateful for today? Number two, who am I checking on or connecting with today? Number three, what expectations of normal Am I letting go of today? Four, how am I getting outside today? Five, how am I moving my body today? Six, what beauty am I creating, cultivating, or inviting in today? Thinking about these questions, being comforted by the psalm, helps to not only cope with the disruption, but also begin transformation. Question three gave me a very hard time. It took me two months, two months to begin to let go of normal. When we let go of normal, we begin to accept we are in this liminal space, and in this space we can grow. For two months, I grieved what I missed out on and just lived suspended in time, waiting to get back to how things were. I was learning a lot of new technologies. I was being creative, working hard, but I was just marking time. Then one day, while I was thinking about my next Erev Tov production, the show I've been doing Thursday evenings, 5.30, I realized how stuck I was. I needed a different perspective too, a more hopeful outlook. The Hebrew saying, Mishoneh Makom, Mishoneh Mazal, change your place and change your luck came to mind. This popular expression is actually based on an ancient Talmud discussion about the ways to soften God's judgment on Yom Kippur. In that Talmudic discussion, changing one's location 
could actually change God's evil decree. I needed a change of place too. I did the next show about exercising in the pool. I literally had to leave the house, change my clothes, and jump into the pool to transform my thinking from when will things get back to normal to I can feel hopeful right now. Once I began to let go of normal, my anxiety, my anxiety decreased. It didn't disappear, it decreased. I created a place for the masks and gloves in the house and cars so they weren't just everywhere and nowhere. I bought a ukulele and started playing. I committed to eating more plant-based meals, but I still haven't gotten to organizing the closets. Of course, it's all a work in progress. Our work extends beyond new skills and lifestyle changes for ourselves, for we need to reach out to others as well. Compassion, patience, and understanding are in short supply when we are feeling so depleted. Yet creating social solidarity by checking in with friends and acquaintances while maintaining our physical distance will end the feelings of isolation and increase everyone's sense of well-being. The prayers and themes of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur want us to grapple with this vulnerability and the ways in which we face the future. They're not to make us feel bad, but to help us grow as individuals and as a community. For only when we recognize our vulnerability and life's uncertainties can we grasp the potential for growth in the present. When we recite in Rosh Hashanah the Unatana Tokaf prayer that asks, who shall live and who shall die? It is to remind us that no one can escape death. Yet we have the ability even the responsibility that through Teshuvah, returning to the right path, Tefillah, prayer, and Tzedakah, righteous giving, to make the quality of our lives purposeful and meaningful, no matter what the length. Judaism has always recognized and prepared us for the liminal space between what we knew and an unknown future. Other years, we might have been able to deny that we or our families might not be the very recipients faced with sudden and serious challenges. Other years, maybe to deny that, but not anymore. Today, we know we all face the anxiety, the challenges, and the worry. The good news? The good news is our past deeds and our own characters do not determine the ways in which we choose to respond and adapt. I may have been stuck and afraid yesterday, but I don't need to be tomorrow. A man was pushing a cart in the supermarket alongside him. There was a screaming child. And the man kept repeating softly, don't get excited, Michael. Don't yell, Michael. Keep calm, Michael. A woman standing next to him remarked, you're certainly to be commended for trying to soothe your son, Michael. Lady, he said, I'm Michael. Over the past six months, we have missed many simchas, joyous occasions. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch notes that a simcha is a transitory joy just like our drive-by celebrations we've been enjoying. And it is almost identical, though, to the word tzomeach, growing, indicating that lasting joy occurs only with growth. Although we have missed simchas, let's not miss out on joy. This is our time for change and for growth, don't let the pandemic take that away from you. And don't worry, eventually, you'll get to the closet. Kenya Ratzon.
May this be God's will. Shana Tova. Amen.